God has placed in my heart a very particular message. And it's beautiful to know that the way God works, because God works like this. He'll share something to one person. But he can also use another person to relate that same message. And he can relate that same message in another way, and another way, and another way. And I can see here today how God has taken one message. And through the entire church, God is trying to relate that one message. Earlier in Sabbath school, uh, our brother was mentioning, if, God, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. Today's special music is talking about honoring and lifting up God. During the children's story, it spoke about distractions. How if we're distracted, it takes us away from God. And today's message is specifically about distractions. And turning away from them so that we can lift God up in our lives. And God can be lifted up so that the world can see. Today we're going to have part two as well as part three this afternoon on fear of God. Before we begin, I'd like to have a word of prayer. Beloved Heavenly Father, once again we're gathered here in your presence. Lord, because we want to seek your face, we want to know what it is that you desire of us. Precious Lord, I ask that as I speak, that you may abide in me, your Holy Spirit may speak out through me, so that the words that come out of my lips may be acceptable in thy sight and may penetrate into the hearts of your children. Lord, open our hearts, open our minds, so that we can all receive you at this time. Father God, I pray a blessing upon this church and upon this message as it's brought forth towards all of us. This is my prayer, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Just a quick uh, recap of what we spoke in our last talk on part one of Fear of God. We spoke about the story of Moses and how God called Moses for a specific purpose. And that purpose was first to demonstrate reverence towards God. And we learned that as Moses reverenced God, it led to power. And we compared the power of God to the power of this world. How Christian nationalists around America are trying to push this idea of Donald Trump to the forefront to become the new president of the United States of America. And he claimed that he will bring power back to Christianity. But we learned that it is the Spirit of God that brings power when we unite with the Holy Spirit. That the power comes from God and not from human sources. Well today we're going to learn what is the purpose of all this power. We, we studied also that... The Bible says when the disciples asked Jesus, when will you come? Jesus said what? Pray that no man deceive you. And we learned throughout all of the, the things that were happening around the world that there's a lot of deception taking place within society. Yeah. But today we want to go a step further. Because we're not only to pray for no one to deceive us. But we also have to pray for no one to distract us. Because if we're distracted, then we can't be receptive of what God wants to teach us. How God wants to prepare us for His coming. So let's begin. Councils to Parents, Teachers, and Students, page 456, tells us these words. All the power of Satan are set in operation to hold the attention to full frivolous amusement. And he is gaining his objective. So he's putting all his attention to frivolous amusement. And he's winning this battle, alright? He is interposing his devising between God and the soul. He will manufacture diver diversions to keep men from thinking of God. The world filled with what? Sports. What is the world filled with? Sports. And pleasure loving. So sport and pleasure loving. This is what the devil is flooding upon humanity nowadays to distract us. It's always thirsting for some new interest. But how little time and thought are given to the creator of heaven and earth. Now, why am I bringing this, this thought up for you guys today? How many of you have followed this scenario here? This we know is found in Paris. But what's beside it? That those, those ring symbols, what are those? The symbol of the Olympics. We have the Olympics taking place now in Paris. And what is that? 
That's a, a large sporting event, right? Well, I would say it's a massive distraction for this world. I would say it's a massive distraction. Now, check out what's been going on. Here's what Elon Musk said, disrespectful to Christians. Elon Musk blasts, blasts Olympics opening ceremony, calls Christianity toothless. So what actually happened during the opening ceremony of the Olympics? A mockery of the Christian faith. Believers outraged by Olympic opening ceremony act. So there's something that took place. Now we can slightly see it in the background, but we're going to go through what this actually what actually happened and how this applies to our study for today. But Christians slam Paris Olympics for woke parody of the Last Supper. So here we have an illustration here. Now this isn't the only picture, but there's several pictures displaying uh, an illustration of um, da Vinci's portrait of the Last Supper, that spread out table with Jesus and the disciples. And this is a mimic of that, that picture. However, it is a perversion of the copy, right? Because da Vinci was trying to up, uplift a, a pure image of, of uh, an event that took place. And here there's a mockery of it. Now, what did this event, this opening ceremony, actually try to do? What was the purpose behind this? Well, Paris Olympics actually admit opening ceremony drag show was based on the Last Supper. Then they tried to walk it back because they started getting a lot of backlash from Christian societies. So what do they say here? A Paris, a Paris 24 Olympics spokesperson admitted the controversial drag show version of the Last Supper seen on Friday opening ceremony was indeed inspired by the iconic Da Vinci mural. Now let's continue here. Paris Olympic organizers apologized to Christians for unintentional Last Supper parody. So we see this conflict between uh, Christianity and secularism. Now, what does that have to do with anything? We're about to find out. This man here, Thomas Jolly, was the, the man who was the inspiration of the opening ceremony. He's the one that planned out and created the whole scene. All right, now let's see what he says, how, how he comes to his defense on the, the event that took place. It says this, there's Dion, sorry, I don't know how to pronounce this name very well, Dionius, arriving on the table. Now this Dionius is the blue character in the, that picture of this blue character, all right? Now, let's see what he says about this. Why is he there? First and foremost, because he is the god of celebration in Greek mythology. And the taboo is called festivity, Jolly says, translated to English. So he wanted to display this celebration ceremony, all right? Conveniently, he used the same illustration as the Last Supper. But it goes on further. He's also the god of wine, which is also one of the Jew jewels of France. And his father of Sequoia, sorry, I can't pronounce these uh, Greek names, the goddess of the river Seine. Now, I'm not going to be so focused on the names here, but there's a reason why I want to go through this historical context for you guys, okay? Now, he's the god of celebration as well as the god of wine. Does that sound familiar? Does it sound familiar? If we open up the Bible and we, we talk about celebration and wine, what, what, is, what comes to your minds? Communion. Communion? Okay. What else? Wedding. Wedding feast? Okay, what else? So there, there's a, usually in the Bible, there would always be something pure and holy, something sacred of God. But then what else would, be, would there be? If God has something, what do you think the devil want, would want to do? He would want to mimic and counterfeit, right? Create some sort of copy. So here we're going to see how the devil is trying to copy, take something of God and translate it into something different. So we have wine here. I'm taking straight back to the three angels' messages where, uh, where there's the wine of Babylon. All right? And the whole world is in this celebration because the Bible says that as it was in the days of Noah, they were eating and drinking. What is that called? Celebration. They were feasting. So here we have this illustration taking place so far. Now, does this really go along with what I'm saying. Dionysus, also known as the liberator, 
the god of the wine, making fertility, festivity, insanity, ritual madness, religious ecstasy, and theater. Now here's what I want to emphasize. He's known as what? The liberator. Who in the Bible is known as the liberator? Jesus, Jesus himself. So here we're seeing another copy of a biblical analogy, all right? So we're going to see even more. Here's Zeus, which would be the Greek goddess, his father, all right? Dionysus' father is Zeus. Now, who's Zeus? Zeus is god of thunder, lightning, and rain. So this is Dionysus, the liberator's father. Now, what does the Bible say? Luke 10, verse 18. And he said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. So what is the Olympics actually illustrating in this Last Supper ceremony right now? Zeus, the father of Dionysus, who is the liberator, is coming to bring celebration, frivolous partying, and it's not of God. This is the counterfeit of what God tried to illustrate at that Last Supper, to bring everyone close to union. We see how the perversion of the gospel is being brought forward and a mockery of true Christianity. Now here's the mother. Her name means mother of the earth. She's immortal. So she was an unmarried princess. So here's in Greek theology, Zeus cheated on his wife with this woman who gave birth to Dionysus and he became the liberator. In concept, in theory. Satan, all right, which would be the, the god of lightning, the Zeus, united with who? Humanity, all right? Mother Earth, united with humanity, and created this liberator. And who's the liberator? According to the enemy, we all are our own liberators, because according to Satan, everyone is their own gods. Everyone can be God. So here we see a manipulation of true gospel. And it's found where? In the distracted form of sport. And no one pays attention to it. No one realizes the manipulation that's being spread at the opening ceremony. No one cares because everyone's so distracted. That they're just flaunting this false theories, false ideas. Now 2 Peter 3 verse 3 to 4 says this. Knowing this first. That there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lusts, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. We see secularism. We see Christianity and this polarizing between the two. And one says, God is coming soon. The other one says, Oh, but where is God? We've heard about this over and over again. And they could care less. They want to live as they please. But the Great Controversy, page 269, tells us these words. Of all nations presented in Bible history, Egypt most boldly denied the existence of the living God and resisted his commands. No monarch ever ventured upon more open and high-handed rebellion against the authority of heaven than did the king of Egypt. Now, why are we talking about this? When the message was brought to him by Moses in the name of the Lord, Pharaoh proudly answered, Who is Jehovah? that I should hearken unto his voice to let Israel go. I know not Jehovah, and moreover, I will not let Israel go. This is atheism. Now let's continue what inspiration tells us. And the nation represented by Egypt would give voice to a similar denial of the claims of the living God and would manifest a like spirit of unbelief and defiance. This prophecy has received a most exact and striking fulfillment, fulfillment sorry, in the history of France. How many of us know the history of France? The French Revolution of 1798, when the deadly, uh, the, the Roman Catholic Church received a deadly wound. And it seems very coincidental that as, as, a deadly, as they received the deadly wound in France, now that they're about to be healed of that deadly wound, what's taking place in France? What's taking place in France? Is it coincidental or is it strategic? It's something for us to think about. Something for us to think about. Not to 
just be distracted and let society tell us how to think. But let's think beyond what they're telling us. Because Proverbs chapter 9, verse 10 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. We don't want to be fooled. We don't want to be deceived. And we don't want to be distracted. Therefore, we need to understand what it means to fear God. That way we can have true wisdom. That way we don't become manipulated by society and other things surrounding us. So let's go through it. Pray that no man deceive you. Our first message talked about reverence and how reverence led to power. And we spoke about the true power of God. Today, this morning, we're going to talk about pray that no man distract you. And I'm going to show you how reverence leads to victories. Because what's the purpose of having power in your life? The purpose of having the power of God in your life is to overcome sin. To gain the victory over sin. We keep falling, we keep struggling, and God wants to give us that power of the Holy Spirit that we haven't had, the outpouring, the latter rain, the double portion, so that we can overcome sin and reflect Him fully in this world, to, to the world. Later on in this afternoon, we'll continue with reverence, how it leads to healing. And finally, how reverence leads to our sealing. You see how reverence is so vital in our walk with God. Revelation chapter 14 gives us the steps. And reverence is the very first step when the Bible says, fear God. The very first step. If we don't understand what it means to fear God, we'll never be able to advance closer and closer to God. So let's go through it. Psalms 119 verse 15. I will meditate in thy precepts and have what? What are we to have? Respect. respect. What's another word for respect? Reverence. Reverence is another word for respect. And reverence is one form of fearing God. We discussed in our last study how there's two ways to fear God. One is having reverence for God. The other one is honoring God. All right? So we need to meditate on reverencing God. We need to meditate. Focus on godly things. And how do we do that? You see, the purpose of power is to lead you to victories. Now, we spoke about that already, so I'm just going to continue here. But where do these victories come from? Does anyone know? Do they come from reverence? Do they come from God? Where, where's, where do these victories in our lives come from? God. God. Yes, correct. But I would say there's something else to add to that. Because God doesn't just give everyone victories or else we'd all be perfect. There's something to add to that in connection with God. Because God doesn't work alone. God wants to work together with us. So where do these victories come from on our part? 1 John 5, verse 3 to 5 was our opening scripture. For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not grievous. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. faith. Let's say it together. Even our faith. faith. So what brings the victories? Faith. 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 You guys all know the, the old hymn. Faith is the victory. victory. Faith is the victory. So here we have a connection of God as well as our faith. If we don't have faith in God, we can place our faith in almost everything and anything. Will it give us victories? No. I can have faith in my work to supply my, my needs, but unless God gives me the strength to go to work, I'm not supplying my needs. I can have faith in schooling to educate me, but unless God gives me the mental capacity to understand what I'm doing in school, I won't be able to understand anything. So we can't just have faith. We need faith together with God. And when we combine the two, it gives us the victories. Now, where does reverence come in this, in this uh, pattern here? Well, I'm going to show you. And I'm going to do it backwards this time. Last time I went forward, this time I'm going to do it backwards. So we're ending off with victory. And we know that faith gets us to victory. But I want us to understand how is it that reverence is tied to both faith and victory. Because we understand that the first step is fearing God. And fearing God has a lot to do with having reverence. So what does reverence have to do with getting us to the point of achieving victories in our lives? Victories over sins. Well, we're going to go to the story of Joshua. There are only three stories in the entire Bible that speci speak specifically in this context of reverence. Now, I'm going to get to what the context is for those who were uh, here at the first study. They know what that context is. But Joshua 1 verse 1 to 3. Now, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, thou and all this people, 
unto the land which I do give to them, even to the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given unto you, as I said unto Moses. So God is giving a promise to Joshua. Every single step that you take, every single place that your foot lays its plants its feet on, every ground, you will have the victory. I will give it to you. Imagine that. No matter where you go, you're never bound to lose. No matter what you try, it's guaranteed success all the time. Imagine that. Imagine a life like that. That there's no, no failure. No room for failure. Because God has said, I will do this. I will give this to you. Now what do we need in order for that to happen? We need a lot of faith, right? The Bible says, if you have the faith of a mustard seed, you can move mountains. So it's not so much about us having a lot of faith, but it's having something in connection with that faith. There's more than just faith. What did Joshua need? Let's go to verse 5. There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. Now, many times I wish I could hear God just sing those words directly to me. And I know indirectly He does because it's written in His Word. And I could take that directly for myself. But many times I just wish God just say those words to me personally. Just put my name there. And say, there shall not any man be able to stand before thee. Because I can say that I've had a lot of people stand in my way. A lot of people trying to bring me down. A lot of discouragement. A lot of stress. A lot of struggles. And I'm sure all of you have experienced a lot of trials in your lives. And a lot of us wish that we can say, no one is able to stand before us. But guess what? If the Bible says it, we ought to believe it. And the reason why it's not happening is because maybe we don't believe enough. Is it possible that Joshua had the same experience of a lack of belief? Or is it something else that Joshua had? Victories only exist because of your conflicts. Did you guys know that? It took me a very long time to realize that. I always wanted everyone to just step out of my way and make it straight, easy path. But then if it was a straight and easy path, I would never have any victories in my life. Sure. So I come to realize that as obstacles come before me, as people stand in my way, as difficulties present themselves, this is room for God to create victories in my life. So I embrace those difficulties, I embrace those challenges, and I encourage you guys to embrace them also because as we embrace them and lift up God in our lives, guess what's going to happen? We're going to be claiming those victories to other people to be encouraged to stand up for God as well. And as we do that, more and more and more, guess who's being glorified? Our Heavenly Father. Well, while Jericho was the first visible obstacle in their pathway, it wasn't the first thing they had to deal with. God never begins His conquest with the outward problem. He begins with you. You are the first problem. Now that's very hard to take in, that I'm the first problem. Because I like to think that I have it all figured out. I like to think that I'm right with God. I like to think that I'm on the right path, and I'm doing everything according to His will. But guess what? God tells me, no, you're the first problem. I need to start with you before I can move on to others. So what is my problem then? Because I need to fix my problem. I want to be close to God. I want to make it to heaven, but I have a problem. And I need to figure out what it is. What is our problem? Well, reverence keeps people from trying to act like God. Did you guys know that? But here's what society says. If your God lets you do whatever you want, then your God is you. Which tells me that I'm not God. I know clearly that I'm not God. And I want God in my life. I want God to do all the great things that He said He would do in my life. But I need to put myself aside. And that means that God has requirements. God has standards. God has expectations, and I need to accept that and live in accordance to that in order for God to be uplifted in my life. But is that what all of Christianity says? No, it's not. So let's go continue. In Joshua chapter 5, verse 2. At that time, the Lord said unto Joshua, Make these sharp knives and circumcise again the children of Israel that second time. Okay, so I'm going to be jumping through the story of Joshua very frequently, and this seems like it has absolutely nothing to do with reverence or fearing God. 
But give me some time here to explain. Because like I said, God doesn't start with the outward. He starts with you. And when he starts with you, he's also not going to look at the outward. Just because I wear a suit, just because I'm up at the flat platform, he doesn't care. He's going to start with the inward. So he's going to look into my heart, into my mind, into my thoughts. And there's three steps that need to take place before our victories. God is going to work on three areas of our lives that we're going to see in the story of Joshua before he can lead us to the path of victories. We're not even getting to the path of victories. First, we need to do these three things. And the first step is surrender of the heart. Now, how do we know this through the story of Joshua? Well, Romans chapter 2, verse 29. Compare scripture with scripture. But he is a Jew, which is one inwardly. And circumcision is that of the heart. So God wants a circumcision, not of the outward, but he really wants a circumcision of the heart. So in order for God to use Joshua, because God wanted Joshua to go to Jericho to do a great thing. But first, all of the children of Israel, God gave an instruction. Before you go to Jericho, I want all of you to be circumcised. Which symbolizes, we, the men, obviously not women, which symbolizes that we need a circumcision as well. We need a circumcision of our hearts. We need our hearts right. And why is that? Because the older generation, what happened in, in uh, the desert? They didn't make it. They all died away. And with time, the customs also died away with them. So God had to renew the pact with them. Those that uh, were younger were no longer circumcised. So there were many that needed the circumcision physically. All right? But we're talking spiritually now. We also need a circumcision. Before we can reach our victories, we need a heart transplant. We need a heart change. All right? And this is what God wants to do. He wants to change our heart so that he can lead us to those victories. Let's continue here in verse 10. And the children of Israel encamped in Gilgal and kept the Passover on the 14th day of the month at Eve in the plains of Jericho. So here they are on the border of Jericho and there's two things so far that they've done. They've been, the men have been circumcised, and now they're keeping the Passover. Why is it that they specifically had to keep the Passover before they would obtain that victory in Jericho? Does anyone understand why? Here's the reason why. All right? They had to celebrate the Passover. Now, what is the purpose of the Passover for them to celebrate? The purpose of it was... Um, let me think here. Just got a blank. That's what it is. Sorry. The ce celebration of the Passover was a reminder of what happened in Egypt, right? And as they were liberated, how do you think their hearts reacted? What was the heart reaction of their parents, their ancestors, when they were liberated in Egypt? They were grateful. They were thankful, right? So this is the symbolism of the Passover. If we're going to get to our victories, first God wants to change our hearts, but he also wants us to have a thankful heart, an attitude of gratitude. Because if he's going to lead us to victories, and we're not even thanking him, guess where we're going to be taking the credit for? We're going to take the credit for ourselves. So he wants us to have a heart of thankfulness. So he led them through this, this Passover celebration to remind them of the things they ought to be grateful for. To remind them, just before they're going to have a victory, remember why you have these victories, how you have these victories. It's all because of God. And the third thing is found in Joshua 5, verse 12. And the manna ceased on the morrow after they had eaten of the old corn of the land. Neither had the children of Israel manna any more. But they did eat of the fruits of the land of Canaan that year. So as they reached the borders of Canaan, God stopped providing manna. And the Bible says that they ate the fruit of the land. All right, that's the third step. So the first one, a change of heart. The second one, a thankful heart. And what do you guys think the third one is? New food. Change, change your food. You're no longer eating manna. You're going to eat the fruit of the land. But what does that signify? What's the symbolism be behind that? Is it just because now you have the ability to produce your own food? There's a spiritual application in this that God wanted them to do before they would reach their victories. And this is this, the application. They were feeding 
in the desert on what would sustain them. It was just enough to get them through the desert. It was manna, 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 and it was enough to sustain them. But God, in order to get us to the path of victories, He doesn't want us just to be sustained. All right? He wants us to be satisfied. Now, when you have a lot of different flavors, is it not satisfying food more than just something plain and bland? This is the experience God wants for us. He wants us to take on that path. But that path, He wants it to be a satisfying path. Not a path where we get there and we're, we're disappointed. We're bored. We feel like turning around because we, we're appealed to something else. He wants to make sure that when we get there, we don't want to leave there because we're fully satisfied. We never want to turn back. But many times we keep turning back because we're always feeding on what just sustains. We're taking the bare minimum. We come to church and just listen to the sermon. What about the rest of the week? Where's my communion with God? Where's that spiritual food, that nourishment that I'm, I'm needing throughout the week? We're just sustaining ourselves. But God wants us to be satisfied. In order to be satisfied, we need a close communion with Him. We need to spend more time with God. So here it is. Feed on what satisfies instead of what just sustains. This is God's method of calling us to holiness. First, working on our inward in those three steps. And now that He's worked on our inward and we're ready inside of us, now He can work on the outward. You see, we learn to walk by what? We learn to walk by faith and not by sight. Correct? That's what the Bible teaches us. But many of us want to do it backwards. We want to walk by sight. Let me first see and experience, and then after seeing, then I'll have faith. And we seem to think that, okay, give me the victories, God. Then I'm going to have faith. And now that I have faith, okay, now I have reverence for you, God, because now I've seen the victories, I've had the faith, and now I can reverence you. We like to always do it backwards. But God wants to do it the other way around. First, you must have reverence. Then, it builds your faith. Then, you'll have the victories. And I'm going to show you guys where the reverence comes in. When we say yes to God, He has the right to interrupt our lives. Do we believe in that? Do we truly believe in that? Because many times we pray and we say yes to God. But then when He comes and He interrupts us, interrupts our plans, our ways, we have a problem with it. It's difficult for us to accept. But walking by faith means that He's going to interrupt our lives. He's going to stir our lives around because He wants to bring about a change in our lives. And we have to be willing to accept that. So the first step, all right? The first step is boldness and determination. So we started backwards to reverence, and we're going to go forwards, and we're going to end in reverence. First step is boldness and determination. Now I'm going to tell you what my fight was. When I was about 17 years old, I wasn't a good Christian like I am today. Not that I'm a good Christian, but I'm a different person. When I was 17 or 18, I don't remember, one of those years, I was very, very rebellious. I walked so far away from God. So far. And I remember there was this one time, all right, there was this one time where I got into a fight with another individual. Now this individual, I had no clue why at first, but he came up from behind me. And he struck a nice strong blow across my face from behind me, and I had a very big black eye. It was embarrassing to walk around with a black eye. He was a couple years older than me, and he was jealous of me over some issue. Don't need to mention the issue, but he was jealous of me over something. Now, I wanted revenge. I was determined to get back at this guy, because whatever he did was very unjust to me. So what did I do? I took up fighting classes. I learned Muay Thai, and I became very, very skilled at it. As I continued in school, several of the students of the school came to learn that I was learning how to fight, and came to learn that I was very, very skilled at it. And this was my revenge. If I ever see him again, now I know how to defend myself. Now I can attack him. Now, I can get what, now he can get what he deserves. All right? I was determined. A couple of days after I got that blow, just before I, uh, I started the, the training, he came again. I was unprepared. He was out on the streets. 
And a couple of my friends came to me into the school and said, listen, he's outside waiting for you. I went out there. My brother went out there too with me. All right, my brother at the time, he had a broken, broken hand. So he was almost useless, but out of his love for me, he was going there to defend me. And we went there. And my brother, because he's older than me, he was going to defend me. He went out first. He went before me. And he reached that guy because he wanted to make sure that guy got what he deserved. Because it was unjust what happened to me. And as I was trying to reach him, my brother's with a broken hand. It's an unfair balance. It's an unfair fight. Automatically, you would know. So the guy started tackling him and hitting him and hitting him. And this is in the corner. Four-way streets, lights, everything, cars crossing right in the middle. I wasn't the same person I am today. By the grace of God, I've changed. And I, I'm here to tell you that changes do happen if you give your life to God. Amen. Now what happened was I was going after him because now I wasn't only determined to hit him for hitting me, but now he was hitting on my brother and I wanted revenge for both of us. And I went after him. I didn't care about cars. I didn't care about the lights on the street. I didn't care about nothing. But guess what happened? Everyone that was my friend, 15 guys jumped on top of me grabbed me, threw me to the ground, started hitting me. What I thought was my friends turned against me. And it's just to warn you guys that many times we can think, we can trust in people, we can trust in others, but if we do, many times they will disappoint us. They will turn their backs on us because the Bible does say many will turn their backs. Brother against brother, father against mother, all kinds of things. We cannot rely on people, but we have to put our full trust in God. And what happened in my life? I was very determined. I was very bold to do what I wanted to do. And I got the training that I needed to get my revenge. But that was not my mission. I was focused on the wrong thing. I was determined for the wrong thing. And many of us are fighting the wrong fights today. We're fighting against each other. We're focusing on each other when we should be focusing on God and the battle between Him and the devil. But this was my problem. I had the wrong type of determination. But when our determination is to do the will of God, then it starts leading us in the right path. So Joshua 5 verse 13 tells us this, And it came to pass, when Joshua was by Jericho, that he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, there stood a man over against him, with a sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went unto him, and said unto him, Art thou for us? Or for our adversaries. Now what do you think is happening here? Joshua has, in, in my views, a confidence. And why does he have a confidence? Because he remembers what God told him. He remembered the promise. No man will stand against you. He was ready to, he had the boldness that was needed. He was ready to defend God, ready to stand up. But there was one thing he was missing. He said, art thou for us or for our adversaries? Many times, we think it's about me or you. And we don't think about God. We forget God. You see, we need to change our perspectives. Because a lot of times we're so focused on, in this new age, with social media, everyone cares about the followers. And it's, it happens often, even in ministry. Many people, like me, I'm, I post sermons. And it's more about the followers, more about the viewership than the actual message, than actually reaching people. And guess what we're doing? We're focusing on ourselves. And Joshua had that temptation, just like Moses. Remember Moses? When God was giving him that, that instruction, I want you to go to Egypt, and you're going to do this, this, and this. And what did Moses say? Who am I, Lord? Focusing on who? who? Self. Joshua had the same perspective. He focused on self. Are you for us or are you for our enemies? He didn't realize who he was speaking to. A perspective needed to change. And he said, Nay, but as captain of the host of the Lord, am I now come? And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and did worship and said unto him, What saith my Lord unto thy servant? So here's what God said. I'm neither. I'm neither for you, neither am I for your enemies. I have come to, not to take sides, but to do what? Take control. Now imagine God saying that to you. See, because very often we focus on ourselves. 
we focus on what we're doing and we're trying to uplift ourselves. And God says, I'm not here to, to take your side. I'm not here to take sides, but I'm actually here to take control. I need you to come down so I can be lifted up. So we need to adjust our perspective. You see this one dimension, two dimensions, three dimensions. You see the different dimensions. There's different layers, different ways of seeing things. If I pick up this Bible, how many sides do you see? Three. Maybe three. If I hold it like this, maybe three, maybe four. But did you know there's actually six sides to see? We don't always see all the sides because the side I'm holding here, you guys don't see. But God sees. And we need to change our perspectives because I can't see everything, but God does see everything. So I need to allow myself to view things in His eyes and not mine. That's walking by faith. And then after adjusting our perspective, we need to choose to act in harmony with that new perspective because we can easily rebel. And this is where it gets to the reverence now. <clears throat> Verse 15. And the captain of the Lord's host said unto Joshua, Loose thy shoes from off thy feet. This is the second time in the Bible that these words are mentioned. And there's only one more place in the Bible that it's mentioned. This is a reference to reverence. God said it to Moses when he was in front of the burning bush, and it's a sign of show respect for me. Once again, God is saying it to Joshua, I want you to show respect for me. You're bold, you're courageous, you're determined to do God's work. But I need you to change your perspective. It's not about you. If you're going to do the work, you're going to do it my way. And I'm going to be the one in control. But now that you understand the mission, I need you to show some reverence. Remember, the first thing God wanted to teach Moses was reverence. Then came the power. And God wanted to do the same thing for Joshua. First, you need to understand respect and reverence for me. You see, God will use your abilities before... God will use your availability, sorry, before your ability. God didn't care that Joshua was the, the commanding chief of the army. God didn't care that Joshua was able to overcome all his adversaries. God didn't care that Joshua was led by Moses. God only cared if Joshua was available. Are you willing to come down to a lower level and put me at a higher level? That's what God cares about. But many times we say, maybe tomorrow, maybe later. And our availability is only soon, not now. And God is never able to work with us. So chapter 6, verse 2, we're getting close to the end of the story, and we know the end of the story. We're getting close to it. It says this, And the Lord said unto Joshua, See, I have given into thine hands Jericho, once again reassuring him of the promise he made a couple chapters back, and the king thereof, and the mighty men of valor. And ye shall compass the city, all ye men of war, and go round about the city once. Thus shalt thou do six days. And seven, the priest shall bear before the ark seven trumpets of ram's horns. And the seventh day ye shall compass the city seven times. And the priest shall blow with the trumpet, and it shall come to pass that when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, and when ye hear the sound of the trumpet, all the people shall shout with a great shout. And the wall of the city shall fall down flat, and the people shall ascend up every man straight before him. So here's the story. We know the story. We know the ending. But then we know this. If God asked you to do something that looked ridiculous to people, would you do it? Would you do it? That's the question. Because sometimes the things that God tells us to do makes us think, God, are you crazy? What are people going to think of me? How are people going to react? They won't understand. It won't make sense to them. But would you do it if God said to do it? This is what we need to understand clearly now because pretty soon it's going to be very real. For all of us who are Seventh-day Adventists, it's going to get very real. And God is telling us to do something today that the world views as crazy, as ridiculous. And it's going to be even more crazy as time goes by. But are you willing to do what God tells you to do? The reason Jericho fell before Joshua is because Joshua fell before the Lord. Do you guys believe in that? Yes. So in order for us to have our victories, what do we need to do? Fall before the Lord. And how, why did Joshua fall before the Lord? Because the Lord told him, take off thy shoes. And after he said that, 
The Bible says that Joshua fell to the ground. Because God said, fear me. And Joshua was willing to accept. He fell down. And at that point, he had the capacity in his prayers to move him to the next step. Many of us pray and we question, why doesn't anything happen? Why don't my prayers have power? Why don't I see anything happening? Well, maybe it's because we're not willing to humble ourselves, go down on our knees. Why don't we go down on our knees? Because we don't recognize who's telling us to go down on our knees. We think it's okay to stand up. And God will accept that. God wants us to come down. Lower ourselves before Him so He can uplift us in the time of need. Joshua 6 verse 10 says these words, And Joshua had commanded the people, saying, Ye shall not shout, nor make any noise with your voice, neither shall any word proceed out of your mouth. What does that sound like? Sounds like silence, right? And what does silence sound like? Reverence. Until the day I bid you shout. Then shall ye shout. There's a time and a place to be silent. And there's a time to shout. Knowing the difference may determine whether barriers stand or whether barriers fall. If the children of Israel chose not to have reverence and stay quiet, do you guys believe that the walls of Jericho would have fallen? No, I don't believe it because they wouldn't have fallen the instructions of God. Therefore, if we look in today's day, if God is saying, I want to break barriers, I want to break walls before I come because I want to save some people. There was a woman there that needed to be saved. She was a child of God. And guess what? She was part of the lineage of Jesus. But Jesus wanted to save that woman. They needed to break the wall to save that woman. What needed to happen first? Follow his instruction. His instruction said, silence. Which means reverence. The interpretation came from Joshua to the people. Silence. Have reverence. Because Joshua understood. God said, take your shoes off. Now, here's what happens at the end. So the people shouted when the priests blew with the trumpets. And it came to pass when the people heard the sound of the trumpet, and the people shouted with a great shout, that the wall fell down flat, so that the people went up into the city, every man straight before him, and they took the city. There's a time to be silent, and there's a, there's a time to speak up. Right now is our time to understand the importance of having reverence, the importance of fearing God. Because if we don't fear God, Ellen White says, those that don't follow the first angel's message will not advance to the second. And those that don't follow the second will not advance to the third. Therefore, in order for us to reach the ceiling of God, we first need to start with fearing God. Amen. And if we don't fear God, we won't be a part of that group to give the loud cry. We won't be a part of that group to call people out of Babylon into God's fold. There's a time to be silent, and there's a time to speak. But first came the time of silence, which means first, we, as a Seventh-day Adventist church, need to come back to the reverence of God. We need to understand what it means to truly fear God. Boldness and determination in the right direction, in the right view, leads to a proper perspective. God is above, I am below, which will lead us to reverence. That's the first thing God's going to tell us to do. Have reverence for me. When we have reverence for God, then it'll build our faith. And as our faith is built, we will obtain the victories. It doesn't work backwards. God is not going to give us the victory so that we have faith to eventually have reverence, then eventually change our perspective. We are not God. He does it in this order because He knows this is what we need in order to obtain victory over sin. Now, here's what happened in the Olympics not too long ago. Winning the gold medal in life isn't about coming in first. It's about what? What is it about? Putting God, first. Putting God first. And that's what fearing God means. Put Him first. Above yourself. Above your family. Above the church. Above everything that we own and possess. Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And all of those things will be added. Stop worrying about today. Philippians chapter 3 verse 14 says this, I press toward the mark for the prize of the calling of God in Christ Jesus. How many of us are pressing, pressing toward that mark? Maybe we've been pressing and then reversing and pressing and reversing, but God is telling us today 
that the steps are this way. Keep going forward. We can't go backwards. We don't have enough time to be going backwards. Now it's onward and forward. Otherwise, we won't make it. And we're going to be closing here in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. Wherefore, see we also are compassed with so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin with which so easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking to who? Looking to Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. God doesn't want us to casually walk. He wants us to run because we're very, very close to the end. And we have a lot of things that we need to change in our lives. But if we want that ultimate victory, if we want to be in heaven with God, we need to run and press, looking always to Jesus and not to others. Amen? Amen. Let us close with a word of prayer. Loving Heavenly Father, thank you so much for gathering us here, for showing us the path to the victories of our sins, the victories of all the obstacles that the devil places in our lives. I pray that you help us to follow your steps. I pray that you lead us to where you desire us to be and help us to fully grasp the importance of fearing you and putting you above everything, Lord. We know that you're calling us at this time to demonstrate reverence towards you, to show what true Christianity is, not a phony Christianity where people dance and scream and take themselves to be God. But Lord, put you at the center and honor you as holy and greater than anything else in this world. Lord, as we leave this place, I ask that your Holy Spirit continue being with us and guiding us and leaving with us. Lord, let this place and let our hearts and our minds be filled with, your, with reverence towards you throughout this Sabbath day. And let that be demonstrated to the communities and to our families also, that we stand for you and we want to show the world what it means to live for you. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.